Welcome everybody to Good the sixth tea. conversation in this series of conversations about human brains produced by Fondazione Prada. I'm Alice Roberts and this evening I'm joined by two experts to talk about what one of them has called one of the most engaging topics bringing together science and philosophy, the problem of consciousness. What is consciousness? Are other animals conscious? What is the relationship between brain and mind? What's the relationship between the mental and the physical? Just a few of the questions we'll be considering tonight. And to help us do that, we're joined by two brilliant experts. Professor Simona Ginsberg is a neuroscientist and an associate professor at the Open University of Israel. She's a physiologist by training, but also a philosopher. Professor Eva Yablonka is an evolutionary biologist and a member of the Segal School of Neuroscience Tel Aviv, as well as being a research associate in the Centre for Philosophy of Natural and Social Sciences at the London School of Economics. So I hope you've already had a chance to see the two short lectures by Professors Ginsberg and Jablonka. We'll start this evening with brief summaries of those lectures just to refresh us on those ideas before we get into the discussion. Now this live session is a chance for you to ask questions and to get involved in this discussion. So if you're watching live, you can send in your questions at any time via the chat box. And I know that some of you have already watched the lectures in advance and have emailed in your questions too. So thank you very much for that. And I will pose your questions to the experts. But first, let me introduce them in a little bit more detail. Let me start with Professor Simona Ginsberg. Simona is an associate professor of the Open University of Israel, the OUI, where she taught biology and the philosophy of science up until 2014. At the OUI, she also developed and headed the MA Biological Thought Programme, which combined theoretical biology, bioethics and philosophy of biology. Her past research interests include the real nuts and bolts of brain machinery. She used artificial membranes and models for biological membranes and studied the neurobiology of synapses including their chemical and physiological properties and the way that ion channels work in biological membranes. In other words, looking at the fundamentals of how nerve cells and nerve impulses actually work. Her more recent interests focus on the evolution of early nervous systems, important evolutionary transitions in learning and cognition and the origin of consciousness in the animal world. Simona Ginsberg and Eva Jablonka work together to write the book the Evolution of the Sensitive Soul, published in 2019. And the two of them are working on another book, which is published this year, which is an art and science project called Picturing the Mind, Consciousness Through the Lens of Evolution. Eva Jablonka is a former professor at the Cone Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas at Tel Aviv University. She's also a member of the Segal School of Neuroscience Tel Aviv, and a research associate in the Centre for Philosophy of Natural and Social Science at the LSE. Her main interest lies in understanding evolution, especially evolution that's driven by epigenetics, by non-genetic hereditary variation. And she's interested in the evolution of nervous systems and consciousness. She's written many books on these subjects, including Epigenetic Inheritance and Evolution, Animal Traditions, Evolution in Four Dimensions, the evolution of the sensitive soul, of course, with Simona and picturing the mind. So to start us, Simona, please could I ask you to just give us a brief summary, just a few minutes um, of your lecture. OK, hello, everyone. The title of my talk was Animal Consciousness, a philosophical and evolutionary approach. In it, I asked what we mean, what we mean by consciousness and said that for us, it is synonymous to experiencing, subjective experiencing, and to sentience. Minimal consciousness that we see in many animals is very different from human reflective consciousness. It includes experiences that are triggered by external receptors that bring about things like seeing and hearing, for example and experiences that are initiated by internal receptors leading to feelings such as sensing the position of the body in space and to feelings like thirst and hunger. 
The concept of consciousness raises many questions. The first one is why is consciousness necessary? Why can't we process information about our internal surroundings and the external world and make sense of it without this subjective feel? Another question is who is sentient? Only humans? Some specific animals? Which and why? Our own naturalistic approach to such questions is an evolutionary one. We start with the fact that consciousness evolved during evolution, a transition from non-sentient organisms to experiencing ones occurred. And we investigate how this happened. In doing so, we were inspired by the Hungarian chemist Tibor Ganti, who tackled another elusive and difficult question. How did living creatures emerge from inanimate matter? Following his methodolog methodology, we formed a list of characteristics that most scientists and philosophers would regard as sufficient when they appear together to render a system conscious. Finally, we searched for a transition marker, a single characteristic that can easily be identified whose presence is diagnostic of consciousness. In our theory and investigations, we discovered that open learning is this marker. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, it is mind blowing. And I think that um, you've, you've um, set the stage there beautifully and, and also just kind of opened up this question, which I hope we're going to explore as we get into the Q&A, that from an evolutionary point of view, it isn't self-evident that an animal which senses and reacts to its surroundings has to be conscious. It opens up the question, uh, then why is conscious, consciousness necessary? What is it actually for? So I hope we'll be able to explore that in a bit more detail. But first of all, um, Ava, please could you summarize your lecture for us? So what <clears throat> I started my lecture by reiterating the reasons for seeking for an evolutionary transition marker. As, I, as uh, Simona told you, such a marker is uh, some kind of a, a single tractable capacity of the system that once we have evidence of it, we have evidence that the transition in which we're interested in our case, the transition from non-sentient to sentient organism has gone to completion. And once we identify this, uh, uh, this marker, this capacity, we can reverse engineer from this capacity back to the system that enables it. So we can understand something about the dynamic of the system that enables the capacity and by implication consciousness. And then I went on to present the proposal that, uh, about our, the evolutionary marker that we have, that we have identified, which is a, a form of learning. It's an open, uh, it's, a, it's, it's something we call unlimited associative learning. It is an open-ended, generative, recursive, and representational form of learning. And, it, uh, and we suggested that the evolution of this learning, which is very, very highly adaptive, drove the transition to consciousness. Uh, I then discussed the implication of the thesis for questions that pertain to, uh, to the neural dynamics that constitute consciousness, what is the architecture of a system that is conscious, to the taxonomic distribution of consciousness, to the question of who is conscious. I pointed to some of the predictions of the theory about the relationship between learning and consciousness. There are some specific predictions that follow from our proposal and inferred the ecological context in which consciousness and unlimited associative learning first appeared and also highlighted some of its effects such as the emergence of beauty. I ended by pointing uh, to two subsequent stages in the evolution of consciousness. The evolution of imaginative consciousness, uh, such as that of uh, elephants, corvids, great apes, and the symbolic rational consciousness of humans. Thank you very much indeed for summarizing your lectures there, which also flow together so beautifully. And those of you who've watched the lectures will know that. If you haven't seen the lectures, you've had a brief introduction there 
and I would encourage you to go to the Prada website and and watch those two 20 minute long lectures because they are really fantastic. So um, I wonder if we could start by um, I'd like to well I, I'd like to invite you to ask questions of each other. So Simona, have you got a question for Ava just to just to start us off? Yes. Um, Ava, there are several theories of consciousness. What does an evolutionary theory of consciousness add to these? Well, <laughs> you're asking an evolutionary biologist. So first of all, I will start by saying that evolutionary biology is the most powerful theory in biology. And it is a conceptual kind of bottleneck through which every theory of life and mind must pass. If some theory of biology, biological theory or psychological theory or sociological theory does not pass through this bottleneck, there's something seriously wrong with it. So evolutionary biology is therefore a very good kind of reality check. And uh, since we believe that consciousness evolved, an approach that is based on evolutionary theory is a good starting point. But it's more than a good starting point, because an approach that starts from the evolutionary transition from non-sentient to sentient beings have some kind, several very great advantages. The first one is that, that the earliest sentient beings do not carry the misleading baggage of later evolved structures and processes that build up consciousness in complex organisms like in humans or in mammals. And recognizing the earliest forms of consciousness will, would enable us also to identify specific processes and principles that can be applied to all conscious beings, maybe. That is one great advantage. Another one is it offers a tentative answer to who is conscious, the question of who is conscious, what is the taxonomic distribution of consciousness. And it can also tell us, an evolutionary approach can tell us when, under what conditions, consciousness first evolved, what its functions may be, whether it evolved once or more than once, whether it was lost in some lineages, how it evolved into new forms, or sometimes richer forms, and what its future can be. So there are many advantages, and I think it's a, a good thing to look at it from this perspective. Thank you very much indeed. That, that's really fascinating. And I, uh, I think it's, um, it's fascinating to look at evolution as, a, a, as an evolved phenomenon and to understand that it you know, started off fairly simply and has got more and more complex. And I, I like the way that you described that, you know, looking for animals with, with simpler forms of consciousness, you kind of stripped away the bells and whistles of the more complex ones so that you can get, get to the nitty gritty of what, you know, what consciousness is really about and, and why it starts to evolve. Um, so, uh, Ava, would you like to ask a question back the other way? Would you like to ask uh, yes. a question of Simona? Yes, there is an obvious question to somebody who likes philosophy. And uh, that is, a, how does your lecture, Simona, relate to what David Chalmers called the hard problem of consciousness? I mean, right. what is the relationship? Right. Well, in my talk, I raised the question, why can't we process information about our, our body and the world and, uh, and about our actions without a subjective field that accompanies this processing? This is exactly the same question that uh, David Chalmers called the hard problem some decades ago now. He considered the easy problems, those that relate to information processing in the brain, for example, the way light falling on our retina in the eye is processed through many stages uh, and structures in the brain. In this case, the hard problem is why qualia, that is subjective impressions, special specific colors like red or blue, accompany this process when certain wavelengths fall on the retina. Chalmers claimed that up till now, no answer has been given to the hard problem. We think that in our theory, we have, to a considerable extent, dissolved the hard problem. We have presented a, an evolutionary framework that shows how certain dynamic organization of dedicated structures and processes and interaction within the brain give rise together 
to the capacity of being conscious. Consciousness is a necessary outcome of a transition that occurred in animals during their evolution, just as life is a necessary outcome of chemical evolution. Thank you very much indeed. And a big claim there to have solved yes. the problem of hard consciousness. But I must say, I'm on my way to being convinced. Let's see if our audience are. We've got some questions um, that have come in from them. Uh, let's start with this one. The term consciousness has a long tradition. Do you think that the meaning of the word has remained essentially constant or have there been substantial changes during this period? So this is difficult as well. This is about semantics and definitions. Has our definition of consciousness changed? Well, uh, maybe I'll take this. The word conscious and consciousness are umbrella terms. That is why there's so many concepts that come under them. It's very hard to define. We hear about creature consciousness, that may have conscious and unconscious states, about access consciousness, affective consciousness, higher order consciousness, minimal consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, to name but very few. All of them have something to do with mental behavior and mental phenomena. Historically, the term was used only in relation to human beings, but today things have changed and it is used also when referring to animals. And today, some people, not necessarily those we agree with, even talk about conscious plants. That is, that is fascinating. I mean, uh, I suppose in, in some ways, then that's similar to a lot of uh, concepts in biology where um, perhaps we could say that biologists of the past probably fell prey to a bit of human exceptionalism and that there are all sorts of aspects of human biology that we now find to be shared um, to, more, to greater or lesser degrees with, with other animals, which is, which is to be expected, isn't it, Eva, if, 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 um, if everything has evolved because we're, we're connected with the rest of life on Earth. Eva, if, um, sorry, I was yeah. I'm probably not directing that question to you um, very well, but um, presumably it's, um, we, we should expect this to be the case that, that, you know, because of evolution, we should expect that um, consciousness shouldn't be a, um, an exclusively human characteristic. We should expect to be able to find it amongst other species in the animal kingdom yeah there is a lot of continuity in evolution there is a question whether there is some kind of qualitative jump somewhere and some people believe that there was so the question is not settled uh, by evolution because of, uh, evolutionarily we sort of although we say there must be continuity at some level it could be that it's at a certain macro level there is discontinuity so the fact of evolution does not resolve the problem uh, completely. It so still this is remains. Interesting. That, that, I th yeah. We think, we however think, that there is a, that there is continuity. That uh, that if we are looking for, uh, at at the, at the question from a, an evolutionary point of view, we see we actually could see the continuity. Although there will be some cases where we will not be able to to say whether a, a particular animal is conscious or is not conscious. And this would not be a, a, a problem of definition. It would be a problem of the inevitable gray areas that already exist, that always exist when you are doing the evolutionary biology. You have the same problem with life. You can identify things that are alive for 100% and things that are not alive 100%. But there is a gray area in the middle where it is very theory dependent. It very much depends on your characterizations and the, and the, and definitions. And it's very, very difficult to decide whether something would, is alive or not alive. And the same, and, and we see the same with consciousness. This reminds me of the whole species problem um, in evolutionary biology, that actually it it's very difficult to, to say, where, yes. you know, you can, you can take one species, which is nicely separated from another in time, um, but yeah. you, you can't possibly say when one species changes into another. Yeah. There's no point the in time. Of, yeah, you have the problem of incipient species. Mm. And uh, mm. it's not a coincidence that both Darwin and, and Lamarck, Lamarck's book starts with the problem of species. 
Yeah. And that's how it starts. He, he wants to uh, deconstruct. He starts with the deconstruction of the, or, 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 of the notion of, of species, of the essentialist notion of species. And Darwin does the same. Well, we've, we've kind of um, touched on another question, actually, that's come in from our audience, which is, um, which is about degrees of consciousness and particularly thinking about humans. And the question is, what kind of difference, if any, does the presence of human language make on the degree of consciousness? And do you think this is a qualitative or a quantitative difference? So I don't know who would like to take that I, first. I will, I'll take it because I did quite a lot of work on uh, the evolution of language. Go for it. Yeah, so I think we think that it is a qualitative difference, actually. Although there is continuity, and we can see the continuity. Because with human language, what happened is that virtual realities became communicated it is possible to talk about, to discuss the imaginative, what what is the future, the past, and discuss it with oneself and with others. So virtual realities become something that is shared. And language also led to new symbolic values. New values appeared in the world, like the good, the beautiful, and the just. And also new goals appeared. That, satisfy, that have to satisfy this uh, symbolic values. They have become constructed and we're, and we're the kind of creatures and the only creatures that thrive to, uh, to fulfill this kind of symbolic goals. Also, the kind of emotions that, we, that uh, we call the normative emotions, guilt, shame, embarrassment, and pride, which evolved before language, we think, were very much deepened by language because the social gaze and the, 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 uh, of others and the evaluation of others and, the, and all the things that go into the kind of social relations that language allows have made our view of ourselves very much dependent on what other people not only think about us, but say about us. And uh, the, so these emotions have become very much extended and enriched through the evolution of language. And also other emotions. Think of moralistic anger, for example, of the anger we all feel, I think rightly, about what Putin is doing today in the Ukraine. And the language also increased greatly the problems of false memory, because you have to make a distinction now, not only because between what happened remembering what happened to you and what you imagined, but, but also what was told to you and what you imagined, or, and what actually happened to you. So false memory became a big problem. And, uh, and, and we deal with it in all kinds of ways, including the development of autobiographical memory. And another thing that, uh, that language changes actually perception itself. There is something called uh, verbal overshadowing. Verbal overshadowing is the phenomenon whereby when you describe something in words, for example, a criminal that you saw, you then have a greater difficulty of actually remembering, ex uh, of actually having a rich image of that somebody, of that person. Whereas if you don't describe in words, you remember the per perception, the, your perceptual memory is much better. So a lot of things changed with language. So we think that language really changed human consciousness in profound ways. Maybe if I may add, uh, cultural evolution expanded a lot with language. And that of course, of course had a great uh, effect on, uh, on our human consciousness. And another thing, uh, an interesting point about uh, the social gaze and emotions uh, in humans is the blush. Only humans blush. Yes, but Erectus may have blushed too before language. Yeah, right, that's true. <laughs> It'd be nice to know that, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice I to be able to go back and- one day, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Once Brilliant, thank you very much. Blushing. Um, so, so yes, you're, I mean, you're saying that that language has had such a profound impact, then that it it is a it is a qualitative difference um, in in human consciousness, having had language for a while. We're not sure how long. Um, 
but for a few hundred thousand years at least. Um, here's another question. Assuming that consciousness has evolved, do you think the process has been gradual or discontinuous? So that's an interesting uh, one as well. If, if I may answer, yeah. uh, what is gradual? It is scale dependent. The Cambrian during which we think consciousness first appeared was only 50 million years long, a very short time in geological terms. Is the diversification that occurred in animal groups during that time gradual or explosive? Human evolution from the chimpanzee to ourselves took about six million years. It was very, very rapid, but there was continuity within this period. Eva, would you like to uh, expand? No, no, there's not. I mean, obviously, it's not something that happened uh, within an ecological time frame. It happened within a geological time frame. Yes. So, so you, it, it uh, essentially, you're saying your answer is that it's continuous, but the but the rate can change. That's right. Yes. yes. Okay, we've actually got a live question that's come in. Can you relate consciousness in animals to consciousness in neonates? There's an interesting question. Who'd like to start with that one? Well, I suppose uh, the test, at least according to our um, theory, would be once the brain begins to develop and the structures in it that enable UAL appear, we would think we would say that uh, potential consciousness is there. So does that mean that human neonates are, are, are always going to be different from from other animals then that the you know, the, the structures, no. uh, the structures are there to support that development? No, not necessarily. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, human development is driven by culture. I mean, we are cultural species, so uh, we know that people who are not exposed to language during a, a, a critical time have great problem acquiring it, and so on. So, and I think this is true for many, 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 many other uh, human-specific properties. And uh, Cecilia Hayes has recently made a very, very strong case arguing that, in fact, most of those uh, uh, property, uh, capacities and properties of humans are driven by, a cultural, uh, by a cultural evolution and constructed by cultural evolution. And we have just the, the very general kind of potential for responding to, to this cultural, cumulative cultural inputs. So I think, uh, so because of that, it is it is not it, it very much depends on the on the cultural environment you cannot disconnect mm. uh, humans from their cultural environment yeah that's that's a really interesting point isn't it because i think that um we we still hear occasionally that 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 all kind of nature nurture debate and, uh, and when you're looking at humans it's it's impossible because if you separate humans out away from culture that's a very unnatural state for humans to be in um, and I love, I absolutely love the quote uh, of Michael Thomas Sellers that a human is born expecting culture in the same way that a fish is born expecting water. I love yeah. that quote. Um, let's move on then to another question. Um, here's one about fish, in fact. So you say that the beautiful patterns of the body of the male fish would not have evolved if it were not for the female's ability to discriminate and choose subtly between different male adornments. How do you define beauty independently then? And how can you be so sure that the male fish couldn't recognize beauty? Uh, Eva, uh, in her talk, uh, expressed part of this sentence, not all of it. She said she didn't say that uh, a male fish wouldn't recognize beauty, but uh, we think that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. It cannot exist independently without an observer. In fact, this question reminds me of the famous uh, question, does a tree branch falling on the ground 
make a sound when nobody is witnessing it? The answer is no. The branch may produce mechanical pressure on the ground when it hits it, and even pressure waves. But without the presence of a being that can hear, there is no sound. And similarly, organized structures and patterns do exist in the world, regardless of evolution and consciousness. But their beauty results from perception and evaluation by a sentient being who may also derive pleasure from, from them. I just want you to have add anything something. To add, Ava. Yeah. Yeah, just something about the male. I mean, uh, of course, the male fish will appreciate beauty, although it may not, reg for example, uh, it will certainly have a, 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 an experience when it sees the patterns on the bodies of rivals. It, it may not see it as pleasing. This is quite possible. It may uh, see it as very, very unpleasant in some ways. <laughs> But uh, it, it will certainly recognize it and have an experience of it. And uh, it has the same mental capacities uh, that he inherited from his mother. And, uh, it, and of, but of course, what the male regards as beautiful will be colored by his life as a male. And do you think what, do you think what the male fish or the female fish end up perceiving as beautiful do you think it, is that really entirely arbitrary i mean how does how does that emerge then because it's because presumably because if, if beauty is just in the eye of the beholder it doesn't exist as a as an independent um essence it in and of itself to say that it, it doesn't mean to say that it didn't evolve the kind of thing that give pleasure are things that that have some kind many of the things that give a pleasure have also some kind of relation to some kind of uh, existential needs of ours for example, there are people who argue that uh, the kind that uh, symmetry, bright colors, beautiful patterns are indicators of fitness in a male, and the female scrutinizes these things. So it is not arbitrary. It is not entirely arbitrary. It is related to uh, it, uh, the, the kind of patterns that are regarded as beautiful have something to do as uh, are, are to some extent indicators of fitness. For example. It's not the only, the only story because there the, the are all kinds of runaway processes, but there is some kind of relationship. So this kind of things are the, 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 the path. So there is a, a, a certain level of arbitrariness, but there is no absolute arbitrariness. And the fact that it is a, a, the very fact that it is evolved suggests that it cannot be completely arbitrary. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I think there's room there for, for imagining that, you know, some patterns might come up, um, it, it, as you say, as kind of runaway processes, um, almost, you know, it kind of spandrels um, just appearing um, during during development in, in a way which is um, which, which almost seems arbitrary. But as soon as another being notices those and perceives them as either beautiful or not, they become evolutionarily meaningful. Exactly. Okay, we've got um, a really interesting question here about where we're going in the future with consciousness. If consciousness is evolutionary, can we imagine that there will be in the future living beings with aug augmented consciousness um, as compared to ourselves? Um, and the question is thinking of beings that will come out from brain machine interfaces, AI, bionics. So could we create machines with consciousness in the future? What a question. Simona. There is no doubt in our mind that such augmented consciousness will be possible and that cyborgs, which are chimeras between machines and biological organisms, will expand. Even today they exist. And in the future, they will become more and more prevalent. Already at present, when we wear a headset of virtual reality, we easily and very quickly enter our own avatar and imagine it as part of our body. This is probably a continuation of a process that began ages ago, when tools such as hammers became an, an extension of our bodies 
culminating today in our smartphones. And furthermore, since the brain is very plastic, we can rewire it in certain cases by using artificial devices. We can, for example, even today implant the brain electrodes that communicate with computers that enable the control of artificial limbs. The mere intention to move a limb is programmed to cause it to move. I think a serious problem may arise from the brain machine interface developments. Once we become cyborgs, if we are wired to other cyborgs, will we continue to have our individual experiences? Will we not lose our autonomy and free will once we are connected to them? Will there be a collective consciousness? What will it be like? And of course, uh, part of the question that uh, you asked was also, will robots be conscious? Uh, Eva, would you like to take that up? We just wrote the paper about it recently. <laughs> so I, 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 we can go on talking about it for quite a long time. But what I want to say is that, first of all, there is no robot in the world that can do unlimited associative learning. It can do very limited things, very, very limited things, better than human beings. But uh, it is extremely limited. So that's the first thing. But, uh, but after, uh, and uh, they don't also have the kind of uh, general value system that uh, living creatures have that uh, is uh, based on the survival and in the case uh, uh, the reproduction in the case of, uh, of biological beings but in the case of robots it would probably be something like some kind of persistence some kind of a common value that uh, from which which is the basis of everything that happens to them we also think that the uh, robots will be much more difficult that it will be very much more difficult than people think to create uh, some uh, kind of conscious robots not only because the it's very very difficult uh, because of the uh, because of the software difficulty but also because of, because of the relationship between hardware and software so for example it is not clear to us that uh, it will not be necessary to use a soft uh, soft kind of materials or what is called even intelligent materials clever materials it is not clear to us at all that it will be possible to have uh, 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 to develop uh, uh, to, uh, uh, that the affordances of ontogeny will not be necessary, even morphological ontogeny, not only a cognitive ontogeny, not only learning, are not will not be uh, are not necessary for the development of something so demanding as consciousness. So, although we do not rule it out, we think that probably it will be possible one day to build the conscious robots and. I'm very worried about it personally because we don't have a good record in our treatment of uh, conscious creatures. But uh, I think it is far more difficult than uh, most people think. Thank you very much, Ava. And uh, you you harked back there actually to the the very first conversation in this series where um, Angela Frederici and and Robert Berwick were talking about um, human language and the syntax of human language. Um, and Robert Berwick was was arguing um, in his lecture and uh, and in our discussion that in fact um, all of the AI that we have at the moment does not recreate human language. It recreates a superficial appearance of human language, but it's actually not doing um, the it, it's not doing the the syntax in the way that the the human brain understands language. So it's interesting to hear you saying as well that you think that consciousness is a, is a much more complex problem um, than perhaps um, some people think at the moment with, um, with robots and AI. Um, the next question is, is a bit more about detail. And, and I must say, this appeals to me as an anatomist as well. And, uh, and I was going to ask you this question myself too, which was about structures in the brain. Um, and the fact that, Ava, you showed um, various structures in, in the conscious brain and, and I wonder if you could, without getting into too much detail, and obviously you, you can't show us images either, but um, I wonder if you could just run through what those what those structures are, what those key structures are that we see in um, in in apes and we see in in octopi and we we potentially see in, in insects as well. Um, so I wonder if you could wonder if you could elaborate for us on that. 
So I will say very briefly because it's really going into gory details here. Uh, so for the integrating structure that I pointed to included units that integrate sensory information. So you need to have sensory uh, uh, integrating units that, uh, the, and it, it has to be uh, integrating information that comes from the external world, from the internal environment, and also integrating motor units that can represent the uh, motor behavior. You, you need to have integrating reinforcement unit systems, and you need to have a declarative memory system that represents uh, composite, uh, uh, composites, it represents events. You, you need all this to interact with each other and they need all to come together and the mappings from all these units need to come together before they result in, in, in a conscious perception and involuntary act. Now, what are these things? I don't want to go into great apes and into humans. Because, because there are great apes and humans, because it, we're already talking about high level structures where the neocortex is very much involved. So among other uh, uh, very important structures for consciousness include, in, in the case of vertebrates, for example, structures such as the optic tectum that controls, an, uh, uh, that controls direct behavioral responses towards specific points uh, in, in body-centered space. That's one. Another one is the hippocampus that is required for declarative memory. And we see it in almost all vertebrates, except maybe the very, 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 very primitive, but already there we have the beginning, the cells that behave like hippocampus cells. Uh, the reticulate formation and the periaqueductal gray that are, that, uh, uh, are very, that where the affective circuitry is converging and diverging from. These are very, very important uh, uh, structures for consciousness. And we know that they are important because when we are, uh, when people have lesions in, uh, in uh, sensory integrating areas, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the primary visual cortex, D1, there, there is blind sight. The result is blind sight. They are, they are not conscious of what they see. They say they see nothing, although they behave as if they see something. We know that the lesions uh, in, uh, of the hippocampus lead to lack of consciousness of past, uh, of past events. We know that the extensive lesions in uh, the uh, periaqueductal gray lead to coma, complete coma. So all these structures obviously are related to consciousness. Now, there are structures also uh, there they are anal analogous structures uh, in, uh, in uh, arthropods and in cephalopods. Now, when I'm saying this, that these structures exist and they have, and I'm talking as if they have distinct uh, functions, sometimes the functions are not, sometimes they have more than one function. One has to remember that. It's, uh, and should, you know, it's, it's not a completely modular system in, uh, in uh, the anatomical sense. And uh, but uh, for example, the mushroom bodies and the uh, central complex in, uh, in insects uh, are believed to be either homologous or analogous to the hippocampus and to the basal ganglia. And uh, the, in, 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 in cephalopods, we have a, a very a great area called uh, the a frontal vertical lobe, which uh, were functions uh, which uh, is analogous, has circuitries that are analogous to those that exist in the cerebral cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdaloid complex in vertebrae. So uh, and, uh, we know that it plays a role in evaluation and, uh, and leads to decision making in the octopus. So there's a lot of analogy there. It's just utterly Is fascinating. That yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and, um, you know, how fascinating that you can delve into that um, comparative uh behavior but also comparative anatomy as well and see analogous structures makes you think a little bit differently about um octopi certainly um i just want to end up with a couple of much broader questions we're almost reaching the end of our time now it's gone so fast um questions about your careers and about science and philosophy perhaps in a bit more general uh, a bit more generally um Simone, I wanted to ask you because I was fascinated in your career and the fact that you started off investigating the biochemistry of nerve cells um, you know, their membranes and the, the molecular details of, of, of how nerve impulses are created. When did you start thinking about the problem of consciousness and not just thinking about it, but actually want to investigate it? 
Uh, well, I have always been occupied by philosophical questions. And during my years in uh, Oxford, while working on my uh, DPhil on biological on artificial membranes, I also had the chance to go to some fascinating philosophy seminars. Um, my main motivation in turning to the study of consciousness was a wish to think about broader topics than the behavior of tiny ion channels, important as they may be. Later, uh, as you mentioned, I de developed the MA program in biological thought at the Open University of Israel. And while preparing a course on the mind-body problem, I discovered a lacuna. At that time, about 20 years ago, very little work on consciousness seemed to have been done focusing on evolution. This led me to trying to convince Eva an evolutionary biologist to collaborate. It wasn't easy. <laughs> but eventually you did, Eva. Um, well, I and, told uh, her at first, yeah, I told her I won't touch it with a barge pole because it will drive <laughs> me crazy. And in the end, she won. And the way she won was, first of all, she said, look, nobody really says anything intelligent, uh, not intelligent, really uh, detailed about uh, about the evolution of consciousness uh, since the middle of the 20th century uh, you know what and i said that to myself well that's true the other thing that she did which was uh, very manipulative was uh, she said well you know why don't we start reading aristotle the anima on the soul now aristotle is my favorite philosopher in the world and i'm i taught the i taught this book i love this book I think it's the greatest theoretical biology uh, text that was ever written, biology and psychology. So I said, okay, let's start with Aristotle, and that's how it evolved. That's absolutely wonderful, and what an amazing partnership. Thank you very, very much for sharing um, the fruits of your collaboration with us tonight. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I would recommend everybody to go out and buy um, Ava and Simona's fantastic books about consciousness. Um, thank you very much everybody for, for watching this evening. Um, and thank you for sending in your questions too. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Simona and Ava for, for all of your insights. Ava, um, you talked at the end of your lecture about reflective consciousness in humans. And I quote, the ability not only to imagine and to plan, but also to communicate about the products of our imagination and to share them. Well, thank you very much for sharing the products of your imaginations with us tonight. So this recording will become part of the archive of the Fondazione Prada Human Brains Conversations project, and it will be available on the website and, and YouTube channel in perpetuity or as long as the website and YouTube are there. You can also find the recorded lectures from this evening's experts there, together with lectures from the earlier five sessions covering subjects as diverse as music and language, lateralization in the brain and neural plasticity. So I do hope you'll follow us for the final discussion in this wonderful series. That conversation will explore the history of modern philosophy and again, the origins of human consciousness. It will feature the philosophers Massimo Cacciari and Michele Di Francesco, and they'll be joining me for another live session on the evening of Tuesday, the 5th of April. So I do hope you can join me again then for this final session in the series of conversations about the human brain. Until then, from me, Alice Roberts, from our distinguished guests, Simona Ginsberg and Eva Yablonka, and from everyone at Fondazione Prada, goodbye, keep well and stay curious. <laughs>